Hello everyone, welcome back to APU Postgrad Webinar. It's me again. For those who first time joining us, my name is Chong from Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, APU. I'm your host for today. Today's live webinar talks cover various topics of Postgrad, which include evolutionary algorithm in the data science toolbox and Doctor of Business Administration, DBA at APU. If you have missed our 2 p.m. session, always feel free to watch replay at our Facebook page or YouTube channel. I would like to invite you to join our APU Postgrad e-open day today from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Our counselors are ready to assist you through all the pathways available for your further study. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.apu.edu.my and follow our Facebook page. Without further, let us explore the Doctor of Business Administration, DBA at APU. Welcome Prof. Dr. Murali, Graduate School of Business, to start the presentation. Hi, Prof. Dr. Murali. How are you? I'm okay, Chong. How are you? I hope you had a weekend. I, yes, <laughs> I'm doing good as well. So, are you ready for the session? Yes, I am. Thanks for... Thanks for being with us for the past two days. Yeah, you've been a fantastic help okay. to all of us. Thanks to your team as well. Let me quickly okay. uh, put it on full slide mode. Chong, just let me know if you can see it. Okay. Cool. Can? Now, yes. Please, can, huh? Dr. Prof. Yes. Okay, thank you, Chong. I'll just quickly go. On. I'll try and keep the presentation as short as possible. Hopefully, we'll take more questions at the end, yeah? Because since this is a new program that we're going to launch. So, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you out there, welcome once again to our virtual open day uh, session at Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation. My name is Professor Murali. I'm currently the postgraduate director of and continuing education at Asia Pacific University, APU. A very good uh Keep, what's the time now? Four o'clock. Very good evening to all of you. We have some of you are probably having your tetarek. Some of you are probably just woke up from a short new Sunday. Beautiful weather out there, slight drizzle. So welcome. So today's session, yesterday I did a session on design thinking. Yeah, uh, good feedback. Thank you for your feedback. Some of you personally emailed me uh, requesting for slides and so on. Yeah, we'll be happy to share them with you. Uh, today, it's a bit different. So we're going to promote a new program that we're about to launch. Uh, fairly soon, when I say fairly soon, probably in the next few weeks, so stay tuned. Um, Doctor of Business Administration, DBA. Again, my profile, for those of you who miss me, this is not about bragging rights, but basically it's just to tell you that the importance of continuously updating ourselves and continuously upgrading ourselves. So if you look at my qualification as an example, right? Every three, uh, in my early days, every three years, four years, from the time I was 24, 25, I asked a fundamental question. What's next? What do we do next? What are the skills that we need to keep abreast with? How do I, how do I improve myself? I think that's the purpose of this chart, basically to say that we have to continuously look for opportunities, look for possibilities to upgrade ourselves as individuals, yeah? And uh, to ensure that we are relevant in the, in the economy. And now we're talking about the digital economy, the new world, uh, things are changing very fast, moving very fast. So if you already have a, a postgraduate master's, what's next? What's next? What, what's in store? So hence, let's, let's, let's discuss this further. Now, this is the normal world. If you look at the world normally, I kind of use the analogy of someone's heartbeat. So if you have a normal heartbeat and if you're on a treadmill, you're exercising. Uh, some of you may have done this, uh, uh, the echocardiograph or ECG, they call it. They put you on a treadmill and measure your, they increase the stress levels and, and they ask you to run, walk, eventually higher speed, higher gradient. And they measure your heart rate, right? And produce a chart like this. So if it's very beautiful, it's very consistent, it's very normal, fine. And this was what the world used to be a long time ago. When I was a young little boy in a very small town called Kuala Pila, I knew exactly what the time was when my father left for work and when he came back. So it, everything was so predictable. But today, we are living in a world that is totally complex. And the heartbeat is like this. The world is beating at this rate now. <laughs> one day, it's from an economic perspective. One day, is boom. Next day, something happens in some other part of the world, in China or in America, in the, in, in the, in the UK. And slightest uh, event shocks the entire world. Yeah, and the pandemic is a classic example of how we were all shocked. February was fine. 
March 18th, when the government announced the MCO in Malaysia, and as you know, as, as we look at things today, how it, the impact has been tremendous. It's been massive. And it's been very, very challenging for some people out there. Yeah, Everyone, basically, I think, is impacted. This, we're living in something called a VUCA world. Yeah, What is a VUCA world? VUCA, V-U-C-A. Let me just break it down a bit. Huh? For volatility, the world is now very, very volatile. It's very fast unpredictable changes without clear patterns or trends. Unlike the past, yeah, where, where, where predictability was something of a standard norm. So we could predict things in a fairly straightforward fashion. So today is no longer the case. The world is volatile. And the world has also become more uncertain, right? Our lives are so uncertain as well. Going out to buy a loaf of bread is becoming an uncertain event because of the pandemic, right? The variants that are all out there, we are very careful. SOPs need to be followed. So uncertainty is... is, is is there now frequent disruptive changes where the past is not a very good predictor of the future, which is why analytics comes into play now. There are multiple variants of the multiple variation of different economic, social, technological changes, which puts a lot of pressure on corporate leaders, corporate thinkers to say, what is the way forward now? How, do, how are we going to make decisions? Yeah. So that's why analytics actually comes into the place eh, to ensure that we have computing technology to help What's something, something, some decision that used to be quite simple and straightforward in the past, today it's become a lot more complex because of the volatility, because of the uncertainty, and therefore leading to us becoming, uh, <laughs> living in an environment that's more complex. Multiple uh, issues that are intertwined, as I mentioned, political, economy, social, environmental challenges, ecological evolutions, which as a result, when we combine VUC, the whole thing becomes very blur for us here as decision makers, as leaders. This is ambiguity is intensified as, as a result of that. So that's the worker world. That's the worker world. And let me just go through, before we talk about the DBA, some, some background to this, some examples of what are the factors that's making the world a lot more worker. So this little bear now, <laughs> melting of the ice cap in the in North Pole, South Pole, so uh, global warming, right? Pollution. And you and I have a role to play in this in our habits, in our behavior, in our look and feel and appreciation of life, our consumption patterns, we are contributing to the environment one way or another, like it or not, right? Our carbon footprint is actually there. So what's our consumption level? How much of air conditioning are we actually using? How much of recycle activities are we actually using at the home? Are we actually participating in the home front at the domestic level, at our neighborhood, at neighborhood level, at the community level, at the society level, at the national level as a whole? So we have a role to play. Uh, to 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 kind of ensure that there's a balance between progress and also environmental sustainability because it is an important factor that's contributing to the the way in which businesses are run today. Fukushima 2011, people wrote off the Japanese economy. They said this would be the end of Japan. Nuclear reactor was was in trouble. Massive tsunami, earthquake that triggered all of those, and people said mm, this would probably be the end of Japan. But Japanese are so resilient; they came back. But remember, again, the Japanese government keeps warning that, hey, look, disasters are a natural phenomenon today. Thanks to, thanks to the earlier slide of global warming and changing continuous changes in weather patterns and so on. So we find the threat of climate and climate change and the impact it has on the environment at a large scale, it is there. It's becoming very prevalent. Bill Gates said in about, uh, I think, I think it's, it's, it's five years ago, he said that, the issue that the world is going to face in, in future is not just technology uh, related, but he, he did say that it's going to be pandemic and disease. Five years ago, he already predicted that, right? Bill Gates, of course, we know as a thinker, a renowned thinker, and, and also a philanthropist and, a, of course, Microsoft founder. Um, said that. And, and he is, even till today, he's saying that you know, we, we really have to manage environment because environmental degradation issues with climate change is only going to leapfrog the whole the, the whole arena of where pandemic and pandemic is in place it may not be the only pandemic that we go through yeah could be others out there as well if we don't manage uh things properly so something to note something to take note of and again apart from climate issues apart from uh issues that surround trade wars with china and, and america and so on they apart, apart from economic shifts apart from volatility in the uh, production of oil, oil and gas. So all these are fundamental shifts that's happening. It's happened, it's intensified in the last four to five years. It's one more very important element that's actually making us all as, as leaders think 
think of think of business new direction yeah, digital disruption i think this is this is very important and uh, it's one of the main concerns for corporate leaders around the world there was a recent survey by searchyourtechtarget.com where they reported almost 85% of corporate leaders till this very day ask themselves the fundamental question am i digitally ready to face the changes am i using the right technologies am i do i really have what is it in place from a human resource perspective from a strategy perspective from a business process perspective and how do i blend all of these components together and to ensure that i'm sustainable my business is sustainable in the long run yeah so this is from wuka you have to add d so is wuka now the world is not only wuka and you're adding the whole world the whole uh, phrase and, and and term called digital whether it's disruptive or, or disruptive or it offers an opportunity for some if you do it well if you play that game well so we have to look at it from a wuka perspective as well so something to think about so again here this is mona lisa again don't want to go to dba very quickly that will be probably very short there's just some storytelling to see how all this is connected and how all this is relevant mona lisa the last count she was worth a cool uh 800 over million yeah i can't see my full screen because stop sharing sign is there let me just push it down a bit yeah 860 million in, in 2020 post inflation adjustment my god she's such a beautiful painting uh she's valued 860 million us dollars and uh just want to at that backdrop say yeah okay that's mona lisa we know been there done that is valuable but let's get this. this is a new form of painting called non-fungible tokens or nfts and this was by by an artist called beeple who took 5,000 images and he called this every day, the first 5,000 days, started this project in 2005. He would take pictures of the community where he would be, he belongs to. He would make them into very small images, put it into a very big canvas, came up with this, and this was auctioned at about 65 million US dollars, non-fungible tokens, NFTs. So digital art now, just to kind of say, look how fast the world has come, is an opportunity out there. So the form, new forms of creativity, new forms of innovative products, thanks to technology, the D in the WUKA has also, while it is disruptive, we don't deny that, it also opens the window of opportunity for new innovators, inventors, thinkers, philosophers to come and say, how am I going to utilize the technologies available out there to do something good for society? So let's, let's think about that. This was by an artist called Beeple yeah? in the NFT space. Again, uh, I was recently involved in a webinar with uh, City Corp, and City Corporation is, tell is telling us that the world cryptocurrency economy has surpassed the one trillion mark, particularly with the uh, participation of the Central Bank of China and the introduction of CBDCs, a Chinese digital currency, via Central Bank. So again, this is another thing that we may want to look at to to ensure that we really understand what's happening out there in the global environment, in the Malaysian environment as well. So money is no longer in physical form. Uh, the role of uh, crypto and the role of things like Bitcoin, blockchain technologies, and, and, and you know other forms of cryptocurrencies is becoming very, very vital to our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, and it's only going to be more important in the future. The way things are actually positioning itself now or playing out in the industries. Yeah. Again, here Michael Jackson. I mean, he won nine Grammy awards, 1983. I was a little boy when I used to drink Pepsi, and because Michael Jackson was a Pepsi brand ambassador then. Nine Grammy awards, thanks to Quincy Jones, the album uh, Thriller won nine Grammy awards. Yeah, but it, it took him several years before he hit one million uh, record sales. Yeah, and compare that to BTS, who kind of at the moment they release a video, whatever video they release, and goes on YouTube. Close to 1 billion downloads in about five days, yeah? 1B. So that's how fast uh, technology is available out there today for us to kind of position out. If you're already a famous artist, a star, utilizing these technologies to kind of increase wealth and exponentially growing the wealth that we've already accumulated thanks to the power and position or strengths or creativity that we have, it's there. It's an opportunity. Uh, chef One, Chef One took him almost 30 years to become uh, a star chef. Uh, renowned in, in, in Malaysia, in this region, and even to certain parts of the world. And he recently did a documentary on uh, this chap. Some of you might be following uh, um, uh, what's his real name? Uncle Roger's real name, I forget. <laughs> My memory faints me, but he's a Malaysian, I think. Nigel Ng? Nigel Ng? He's in UK. And again, an instant hit. And he started off his career on YouTube by just commenting on people making fried rice. And he is he has close to 8 million subscribers, social media influencer, big name, not only in the UK, but other parts of the world. My kids love him. 
Uh, I like watching his comedy online. This is one thing called Uncle Roger, if you haven't seen it. And Chef One also said, wow, oh, Roger, you're very smart. Now you just go on YouTube and you make, you can become very, very famous by just commenting on fried rice. Took me 30 years to get Chef One as a restaurant in KL. Yeah? So just look at how the world and how fast things are changing thanks to different digital platforms that enable greater reach and market access to community out there to people out there. TikTok is such a, one example. So how all is all of this relevant to APU's DBA? If you say, hey, Prof Murali, I signed up to listen to, you, to listen to you talk about DBA. What are you talking about, Uncle Roger, Chef One, Michael Jackson? Yeah, it's all connected. <laughs> it's all connected because we really have to ask ourselves, hey, have, am I progressing with time? Uh, do I really understand what's happening out there? What are the new business models out there? What are the new strategic outlooks, strategic imperatives out there? How does strategy blend with technology? Uh, how do I, as a corporate leader, corporate thinker, as an employee who's aspiring to reach up that corporate ladder, really understand the different dynamics that's out there? So it all comes together and say, okay, now, is this the time for me to do a DBA? If you read this morning's article in the Star, I think I was actually quoted there, thanks to, uh, I'm not sure if Anis is online, our marketing team, uh, and so on. So we had the opportunity of doing an interview with Star, which really says, this is the time, the time is right for us to upskill ourselves in the postgraduate area. It's, it's growing, it's a growth space for many uh, institutions right, in Malaysia as well as in the world. So if you're wondering, is this a good time to study? Answer is yes, because the world is changing very fast. And some of the content that we bring in to classroom is about the changes that's happening out there in the world. So hence the DBA, yeah? So it's definitely relevant. And uh, some of the core features of APU's DBA, now let's get a bit more technical about what the DBA is about, Doctor of Business Administration. Yeah, at the end of this program, just like how you uh, how someone finishes a PhD, you're entitled to carry the, doc the title Doctor, DR, right, in front of your name. So I was just joking, even Datuk ships, you can, you can, you can, it can be removed huh, if you are, if you suddenly you, you get into criminal activities and so on, the, 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 the king or the sultan that's awarded you the title has the right to revoke that, yeah, because of fraud and, and whatever else. But when you acquire a PhD or a DBA, that the title doctor remains with you, yeah. So it's something to look forward to in life. You're thinking, ah, it's there, okay, kind of nice to have that in your name, I guess, opens a bit more doors for you, a bit better options. So, some of the core features of APU's DBA it, it offers a unique blend of digital technology and, and business. So this is where APU is very proud. And if you look at APU, we position ourselves as a leader in terms of the fourth IR and beyond. Now we've been looking at five, the fifth industrial revolution, and, 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 and we are positioned very strong in that space yeah, in the industry when, when you look at uh, technology, the nine pillars of the IR 4.0 space, and we combine that with the business thinking, what, what's the way forward? And we blend, it's a unique blend of both tech and business offering in the DBA program. Yeah? And it's very relevant to, to industry trends, to global trends. So it's position, it's written, the modules are, uh, are derivatives of things that's happening around us. And that's how they are actually written to ensure that you get best of what's happening out there and, and working on solutions that, cases, solutions, problems, that that's actually a reflection of what's happening in, 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 in mainstream industries across the world as well as in Malaysia. So that's the second strong that's strength of the whole point. So it's delivered the factory with strong industry experience. Now, if you, if you just take uh, my own profile, I wasn't a born academician. So I spent a good eight and a half years in the corporate sector before I said, okay, enough, having lost all of my hair and stress in the corporate world to kind of say, okay, now let me pursue a much more balanced lifestyle. And I joined academia yeah? and uh, life in academia. Eventually you become a professor. So, and many of the APU staff, the team, the, even our vice chancellor, he comes he used to run Motorola. I mean, if, if, if Dr. Ari, I'm not sure if he's online. He, very, very experienced person. Uh, he brings in a lot of industry knowledge and know-how. And many of our staff are from the industry, or they used to be in the industry. So they come with very strong experience, and they deliver some of the programs at some of the modules at the DBA level. So it's delivered by faculty with strong industry experience, which makes it more uh, relevant and not just from a theoretical perspective, the unique blend between theory and practice is very vital for a program like DBA. Flexible learning assessment. I personally took a look at all the modules that we have out there. We're doing away with final exams. So it's more of in-class assessments, teamwork, discussions, and, and also uh, flexible uh, final assessments, eh? which, which is not the traditional exam, sit down writing an exam over three hour period. So that's something to look forward to as well. And it's backed by very reputable partners such as CMI, Chartered Institute of Management, the UK, a partner of ours, 
and also the Malaysian Institute of Accountants, MIA, who have endorsed the program. Both parties have endorsed the program yeah, at, 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 for APU. So again, endorsed by MIA, accredited by CMI, and offered to you by APU. So again, digital transformation, central theme of our APU DBA program, as I mentioned, and why we place a lot of importance and emphasis on digital transformation is because the way the world is actually moving forward. Yeah, it's actually positioning itself very well. The program is positioning itself very well to ensure the talent that actually come on board are future proofing themselves. So if you decide to embark on this journey with us, you'll be rest assured that you are you are you are learning what's relevant and, and you are been given the best of technology as well as business, as I mentioned. Yeah. So we just go up, go up the scale from level one, business as usual issues, all the way to how do we become more innovative and adaptive yeah, through digital transformation. Uh, and digital transformation is a new mantra for modern day corporations. We prepare you for that. Uh, again, courses that look at it from a strategy perspective, from a decision making perspective, using data analytics, uh, technology blending with strategy. So these are all infused into the modules. Let me, I'll get on to the modules fairly shortly, probably in about one or two slides. Yeah. So again, unique features of the APU DBA. Uh, we bring in things like FinTech uh, developed through our engagement with MyFin. Uh, economics, we look at our partnership and with, from professionals and the, the, the UK, UKRI. A research Council for Economics and Social Research in the UK, also a program partner of ours. And we introduce design thinking principles. Uh, I myself am a certified, fully certified design thinker from Stanford University's D School. So a lot of the courses are actually embedded with the design thinking principles. So when we think about digital technology, digital transformation, we put our participants through a design thinking process rather than just creating a solutions, uh, going through things like uh, the empathy, problem formulation of the defined stage, the ideation, the prototyping, the testing sort of cycle within the design sphere, then offering it in the context of repositioning uh, digital technologies and platform as a solution for organizations. So that's an integral component of our program, digital thinking through design elements. Leadership, again, for any DBA program, leadership is an important element, yeah? Because you may have the best strategy, you may have the best technology, you may have the best employees, but if there's no right leadership or the attitude of a perfect leader, or at least somebody is close to being a perfect leader, driving the organization forward, everything else falls short, yeah? So leadership is also an important part. And for the leadership component, we bring in a lot of case studies, real world case studies through our partnership with the Engineering Council of the UK, EC UK, yeah? And although it reads engineering, you'll be wondering what has engineering got to do with DBA? They have a very powerful database of case studies which looks at leadership, yeah, leadership issues. So that's point four. Data science, again, as I mentioned, one of a very strong program is in, in data science and data analytics space from the tech school, the PG tech kind of schools, yeah. So those sort of programs, we infuse that into the DBA curriculum. Uh, digital business transformation, talked about that. And also uh, the last point is on marketing research content in consultation with the Marketing Research Society of Malaysia, MRSM, to allow the participants to work on projects that are highly relevant to what the industry trends and requirements are. Now, you may be wondering, okay, I had a good, I had enough background of what the program has to offer at a, at a macro level. I need a bit more details. When are you guys starting? Yeah, okay, we are, we are offering our part-time intake to kick off in about three weeks from now. So September, 2021, modular basis. So if you're interested to start as soon as possible, uh, do not delay good things in life. Join us right away. Part-time intake kicks off in September 2021. When we say modular, it's one module after the other. So you can expect about two months every module for alumni that are out there. If you've been in our Thought Master's program, uh, it's pretty similar. The, the structure is pretty similar to a part-time master's program that, that's done on a thought basis. Yeah? And at the tail end, you would have a thesis component or a final year project to actually work on. So if you're doing this full-time, minimum three years, maximum five years, part-time four to six years. So uh, why do we need four years? You may wonder if I do it part-time, can I do it in three years? The first, technically, the first 15 months, you're going to be doing uh, coursework. Yeah? You, you finish the modules. Then the balance, we give you enough time to think through of a project, a dissertation that warrants you at the end of it, the title doctor yeah, of, of business administration. So again, timeline, capture this, take a photograph in your memory. Part-time starts September 2021, full-time starts January 2022. 
Uh, professor, what can you talk a bit more about the modules? What modules do I expect in class? Okay, there are four modules that are offered in the online mode. So technically, you could call this a hybrid offering. Uh, the courses that that are offered online, uh, one of it is research methodology. I personally teach that, or at least will teach that. Research methodology. It's a very important program. Uh, sorry, important module because learning research is going to be very helpful for your final component called dissertation. So this first semester. Uh, again, this is, may not be the actual order, but in principle, the subjects have, we've agreed to offer them in that sequence. But uh, the, the sequencing between research, fintech, advanced, and strategy for semester one, there could be some interchange because we may not want our students to actually come and look at research first without understanding things like strategy. Yeah, So we may play around with that. But in terms of structure, research methodology, uh, fintech and corporate financial strategies, advanced marketing intelligence and research, strategic management, integrated value chain, value creation. So it's very finance strategy orientation in semester one. Semester two, with a bit of research methodology coming there to give you a good feel of what research is. How do you start thinking about the final dissertation, the, the thesis that you're going to write at the tail end early on, early on, semester one, some introduction there. Yeah, Semester two, uh, this is where the leadership sort of skills come in, the leadership competencies, so leadership and organizational science global economic issues and this issues like the VUCA things that I was talking to you about. Again, looking it down, dissecting it from a case study perspective, transforming businesses digitally, online class, digital thinking, design thinking, innovation management, another online class. So again, semester two, leadership, problem solving, uh, creative thinking, design thinking, digital, that's the theme, semester two. Semester three, looking at a bit more tech, sort of looking at how do we make decisions using data science and business analytics. Again, a very important class that the, the students go on. And that should position our candidates very well as you move towards your dissertation with the final component. You either choose quantitative or qualitative research. Why do we give you an option? Because not everybody has uh, the, the similar outlook to research. Some of us may feel that, hey, I want to look at a more, I'm, I'm more of a positivist a researcher, a more somebody who brings in a more sort of deductive mindset to approaching problems. Yeah, maybe quantitative research is something that you are more familiar with, you have a flair with, so why not look at quantitative research? Or some might say, I like looking at greater meaning towards sentences, greater meaning to people's perception of things, greater understanding of why something happens. And I want to go beyond just collecting data and looking at it from a statistical perspective. Um, I want to interpret, I want to interpret stuff better or interpret. So I'm, I'm assuming a more interpretive sort of mindset and thinking. So you might be a qualitative researcher. So we give you the option, but uh, worry not. Uh, the purpose of the research methodology in semester one is to give you a good grounding of what to expect. The different research formats that are out there, the different research styles, the different epistemology of philosophy of research out there. So we will introduce you that early on so that you can make a conscious decision. This is my way forward, yeah? I think I want to go and do a quantitative study, yeah? Also, that's a derivative of your research topic. Certain research topics would require you to look at it from a quantitative perspective. Certain will require you to do it from a qualitative perspective. Worry not, that's why you have the supervisors who will guide you for the final part, which is the dissertation component, which consists of the doctoral colloquium and professional workshops that's helping our students to ensure you are prepared to, for things like your proposal defense, for your mid-candidature, and ultimately your viva in the end, yeah? Also work completion in between. Um, and, and you have a dissertation component, which is part of the program standards uh, as, as approved by MQA and also the ministry, which is a requirement, the DBA dissertation. You'll be wondering, how is a DBA dissertation different from a PhD dissertation? Well, word count is one, 40,000 compared to say 80,000 minimum for a PhD. That's, that's one way of looking at it. The other way is the extent to which we perceive rigor in a DBA dissertation versus a PhD dissertation. Um, all of that will be explained to you probably when you do your research methodology class when you come in. Yeah? But of course, if you have questions along those lines, we could explore this during the Q&A session. So once again, it's modular for the full uh, part-time program. Uh, for full-time, you'll be running several parallel modules at the same time. Hence, you finish a lot faster compared to the uh, part-time mode. And we start off, uh, we kick off in September 2021, slightly over three weeks from now. And, and you end with the dissertation at the end. Everyone says, well, well done, my friend. You are now Dr. So-and-so. You've successfully graduated from APU's DBA.
program. I believe that's the end of the slides. I'll take questions if there are any. Chong, back to you as the host for the Q&A. Thank you. OK. Wow, 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 wow. Well, this is a very informative session. Prof, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Thank Chong. you. So now you give me a homework. So I have to think like whether I should join September in tech or January next year in tech. It's very interesting. Wow. OK. So now for you, September. Uh, September. For you, September. Yeah. Don't for, worry. For me, it's September. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I should join. It's very, very uh interesting program. Okay, so uh now is our QA session for everyone. Sure. So please feel free to drop your question at our comments area. Um yeah, prof. Uh, we yep. have a question from Fitra Zaidi. Okay. Okay. So uh, the question is, how is DBA at APU different from other universities in Malaysia? Okay, I kind of expected that question to come. <laughs> uh, okay, interesting. Now, if you look at, if, if you do a snapshot of different DBA programs out there, you will find uh, majority of the programs are pretty heavy in terms of management leadership focus. Yeah, so they focus a lot on management, a lot on leadership strategy. I'm not saying that's wrong. Fine. That's one way of looking at a DBA. But ours, I think, Chong, as I, as I mentioned, it offers a very unique blend of, I would say, 60% management leadership issues, 40% we're diving a bit more deeper into technology. Yeah? And, and one specific module that, that is actually kind of the word is, if I may use the word, borrowed from the tech school, which is the data analytics that we bring in yeah, for decision making. I think that's that's a unique feature which which you might not find might not find easily in other programs. It's something to think about. So again, I was a good blend of business and technology and how you move forward decision making in that context yeah, at a DBA level. So that's 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 one quick answer to that. Again, yeah. the other differentiating point might be who who delivers this program. As I mentioned, we have a very strong uh, uh, faculty that are industry experienced people industry experience and again if you have a full-blown academician who's never been in the industry they most often we have webinars seminars we bring in a lot of other people who actually come and support every module yeah and 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 mm -hmm. hands-on experiences from even some of our leaders they are very seasoned people who are industry stalwarts in the fast as i mentioned yeah earlier so they will be featured in the classes as well from time to time mm. Okay, yeah, we tried. I I think uh, Prof. Dr. Murari has answered your question. Uh, Prof, we have another question from audience uh, from Afe Hanif. Okay. Okay. Hi, Prof. Dr. Murari. Thank you for the great session. Can those with a non-business background pursue a DBA? Of course. <laughs> uh, no issue at all. Can a person from a non-business background pursue a DBA? Um, I've been teaching uh, DBA and even PhD students for more than 15 years now. We're well, getting old, 15 years already teaching DBA and PhD. I, I get students from all, all walks of life, and some of them are hardcore engineers. And they actually, they, they, they were, some of my former students are actually CEO of engineering companies. Some of them start up their own engineering firms uh micro entrepreneurs in the engineering sector who have no clue of finance yeah no clue of accounting no clue of strategy nothing but still they do extremely well because we need to understand the way in which a dba program is delivered is not so much to actually test your theoretical knowledge about subject matter yeah at like like what you probably do in a in a bachelor's program right uh, define an asset. How does an asset differentiate itself from a liability? You know, what is short term versus long term? Yeah, that's, that concepts are introduced in class. But what we are looking at is how do you apply those in, in real world decision making? So if you're an engineer running a company, uh, you just apply the knowledge that you have to make decisions better. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's wholesome in that, in that context. And, and you need not have any, I mean, very strong theoretical background in business. Yeah. So no, it's it's meant for all. It's meant for all, of course. Okay. Yeah. Um, Prof, we have another question from audience yeah. uh, from Juginda Singh. Okay. okay. PhD vs DBA. So how do I make a decision on which one to pursue? Both has thesis. Ah. Okay. Um, 
No easy answer. Very, very good question. 100 points for the person asking the question. <laughs> no easy, no easy answer to this. But I, I often look at this from two, two angles. First, in terms of we really have to ask ourselves um, my career path in future. And my advice often, I think we met someone Chong earlier, right? Who had a similar question at two o'clock when we had that one-on-one -on -one interview with that person. I think it was Mr. T. Uh, again, I, as I asked T at two o'clock today, the person signing up for this has to be very clear. Uh, what, what's your career aspiration? Do you see yourself, uh, say five years down the line as a corporate leader, corporate thinker, uh, leading massive projects and so on? And, and you find that you need some guidance in terms of appreciating business from a different perspective, I think DBA is the right choice for you. But if you feel that uh, I want to be five years from now, I want to be uh, uh, an academic in a university. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I want to really get deeper into research, research grants, producing papers, writing in journals and so on, like, like, like Prof Murali, for example. <laughs> Yeah, then I may need to make that career switch to academia and then PhD might make a lot more sense. Yeah, although there's a thesis component for both. That's one way of looking at it, your career aspiration. So my, my answer, I'm not saying this is the best answer, but mm -hmm. this has been my own, my personal philosophy looking at this. So if you are building yourself from a corporate perspective, the corporate perspective really recognizes a DBA. And sometimes people like me are perceived to be very theoretical in the corporate sector. Say, hey, Prof, you are an academician, la, Prof, so don't talk so much from your theorist. You're not so much a practical person. I have to define that and, and say that, hey, look, I bring in eight years of corporate experience before I join academia. Yeah. So then they listen. So it's always that tussle between corporate and, 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 and academia. That's one, one route. So again, to answer that question, if you positioning yourself as an academic future, I think PhD might be your your, your cup of tea. But if you really want that flair of that breadth of initial subjects, initial modules, then diving deeper into a particular aspect of business or management or leadership or technology and in your final project, and then DBA makes sense from a corporate perspective, yeah, for a future. That's one. Uh, the thesis component, again, slight difference, yeah. So again, uh, I've been examining DBA and thesis for almost 10 years now. Ever since I graduated, I also have examined theses from certain universities in Australia and uh, New Zealand uh, as part of the research collaboration and so on. And I find that uh, two key difference. Number one, as I mentioned, the, the volume, uh, the, the depth of the research. It's probably, uh, I wouldn't use the word shallow, but a bit more uh, at a higher level for DBA. And the DBA thesis tends to be more often than not a lot more corporate driven, actually solving a corporate problem by looking at research, by using very structured research methodology. Both, of course, you follow research methodology in a very structured manner. Mm -hmm. But I guess for a DBA, what we're looking for at the thesis perspective is your, your mastery of using research techniques, the right methodologies and tools to address a problem. And largely, it's, it's, in, it's a corporate problem. So the focus, a lot of the focus on theory is not entirely, it's it's there, it's important, but that's not the only thing that you look for in a DBA. But for a PhD, it's, it, it really is a contribution to the body of knowledge, contribution to theory uh, and also practice, but the theoretical contribution is absolutely important. Yeah? So some, some fine points, no right or wrong answer for this, but again, to quickly recap, what do you see yourself five years from now? Uh, are you more interested in academic line? You're more interested in a corporate line? I would say if you're interested in a corporate line as a as a leader and you need to upgrade yourself to different competencies, DBA might be the right answer. I hope I've answered. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Okay, sure. Prof. Um, there's one question for myself. Okay. okay. So, is there any a uh, length difference? Length of the thesis. Is there any difference for PhD and DBA? Yeah, I think I covered that earlier. So. Technically, you're looking at about slightly anywhere between 40 to 45% less la, in terms of word count yeah, for a DBA thesis. Yeah. Slightly less. Not slightly, quite, 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 quite a lot less in that sense. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. So uh, we have another question from uh, Chin Long Yu. Okay. So what is the benefits of doing a DBA? Okay. They are... So when you look at benefits, you can answer the question benefit from multiple perspective. Benefits to you as an individual, benefits to if you're a sponsored student by your company, benefits to your company. So let me just look at these two benefits. One, for an individual, as I mentioned, if you come from a non-business background, 
be uh, rest assured that at the end of your DBA, you suddenly going to find you, you're going to feel very rich. Orang kaya, they say, kaya dengan knowledge, kaya dengan kaya pengetahuan, dengan. ilmu. Peng- wow, this concept I really did not know three years ago. Suddenly, I feel like I know all of this. Uh, right? And when I'm sitting at board meetings or meetings with my senior management team, well, I'm able to look at an issue from multiple perspectives. You know, if you are say from a very tech background or an engineering background, right? So mm-hmm. we we may have seen the world from that particular perspective. So you finish a DBA by just finishing your modules, not even writing your dissertation. Suddenly you feel that, well, I can look at an issue from multiple perspectives. Even for me, when I did my MBA, right? When I did the MBA, my first degree was in economics, right? So very economic view of life. So when I did my MBA, suddenly you're looking at strategy, business, technology, accounting, finance coming in together. One issue you're able to dissect from multiple angles. So that personal benefit is for a bit, you, you will find yourself more enriched from a competency perspective. That's one. And secondly, of course, there's the benefit of carrying the title doctor in the end. Lah. So <laughs> suddenly you are, wow, you're now a doctor. Oh, very good. Now what you you, you start, wow, APU, you did DBA. Oh, very good. Lah. So what what's your thesis of oh I did digital business transformation issues and challenges in a company? You know, I studied my own company and now I I, I got the best thesis award. So, wow, very good, lah, doctor. Suddenly from Chong, they call you Dr. Dr. Chong. And for Chin, Dr. Chin. Wow, makes a lot Dr. of Chin, difference. Eh? Makes a lot of difference. I tell you, the, my, my highlight uh, when I did my PhD, there were moments, let me be very frank, there were moments that I, when I was in the US, I thought of giving up, you know. I said, cannot, lah. I cannot finish this program. Lah. Uh, <laughs> I better go back to Malaysia. Then when you, when you feel like coming back to Malaysia, and then suddenly you look at the Malaysian flag, you feel... Wow, am I letting my country down? So you pursue, lah. You go, you go, you finish. And when you walk up the stage, you graduate. They call my name. They say Murali Raman. So I went up the stage. Then when they do the hooding ceremony, right? They say from today your name is now Doctor Murali Raman. Well, you kind of feel like very cool, lah. But orang kata seju, orang Malayu kata seju. You know, very cool. Nice, lah. Some some class. So yeah, DBA gives you that option. So Doctor Chin. Oh, I already call you Dr. Chin. Yeah, Dr. Chin. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> so after this session, visit our website www.apu.edu.my and register yeah. with us for this DBA program. Yeah, yeah again, uh, Chong, for, for let's say if Chin is a sponsored student by his company or if he's already a, if he runs his own company, I think you'd be making a lot better decisions with that knowledge. Your writing will change. I'm, I'm, I'd be t- I guarantee after three years, the way you position papers is going to change. The way you write, the way you structure your thoughts, the way mm. you put things down in paper, the way you present, definitely thinking. will change. Mm. Your thinking, thinking yeah, it's about that. It's about that. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we have another question from Faha Othman. Okay. Good sharing, Prof. May I know what is the difference between DBA and PhD program? Oh, I think um, just now Prof already answered you might can answer oh, again, uh, Chong. No yes. worries. Hmm. Uh, hey, sorry to cut you off, Chong. You made you wanted to make a point, or, or you're done with your point. You want me to? I, I'll answer this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Prof, you can okay. continue. Farah, again, very interesting question. Uh, for PhD, is a direct by research, meaning to say, you don't take modules, lah. So if you, so let's say you sign up on a our PhD program, uh, a, a PhD by research. What happens immediately is you will be assigned to a supervisor and you start working with your supervisor from day one. You go through several uh, methodology classes. yeah. So there's a methodology class that you go through. Uh, but by far and large, it's entirely self-study sort of mode. So you'll be working on your research directly with your supervisor with guidance. Lah. Uh, so that, that is the PhD part. So you don't take module one, module two, module three, module four, and so on. So it's direct into a, a research program. So for DBA, as I mentioned, you go through the modules first, then we prepare you for the dissertation component. Yeah. So that's one major difference between the structure of the program is different. The focus of the thesis is also slightly different. Both focus on rigor or, or the quality of the methodology. That's, that's very important, whether it's PhD or, or DBA doesn't make a difference. But the pitching of the DBA thesis is slightly different. The pitching of a PhD thesis is very different in that sense. Yeah, from a theory versus practical sort of perspective. So I hope I've answered that. Farhan, you are more than welcome to contact me morally at apu.edu.my. Write to me anytime. Yeah, we can have uh, private conversations on, on this as well. No issue. Hmm. Okay. Um, Prof, I think today's audience is very active. There are a few more questions from audience. Can, can, can. No worries. Uh, yeah. 
there is a question from uh, Arma Tu. Okay, is this program accredited by external bodies? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the program is accredited by CMI, Chartered Management Institute UK, which is our very, very critical partner for not only DBA, but many other programs for APU. It's, it's a very, very important partner to us. So CMI accredited this. And the other partner that is very important for us is MIA, Malaysian Institute of Accountant. Yeah? They are endorsing the program. So to answer that question, yes, it's accredited by external bodies as well. And we are a fully accredited pro this is a fully accredited program by mqa meaning to say it's recognized not only in malaysia but other parts of the world because it's 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 done with within that umbrella yeah hmm. okay uh prof we have question from muhammad anis great okay. presentation prof are there any exemption granted in dba based on work experience and pg qualification yeah this one uh anis i think we, we look at it on a case-to-case -case basis yeah uh for for students there might be something called i'm coming in with prior experience through so we can probably look at you know the apple uh we we cannot use apple at apu yet i think we're working towards that but looking at that route getting some uh, credentials transferred yeah that's something that we can discuss but it's on a case-to-case -case basis then. But i think they are like for alumni i think there's an automatic 10 percent discount that we actually offer as well so something to think about um so yeah work experience and prior qualifications in an informal setting we can consider that but we we look at that on a case-to-case -case basis within the program standards that allowed by mqd again so i can't say upfront immediately that yes or no but we do it on a case-to-case -case basis yeah hmm. okay uh prof we have a yeah. question from Janita. okay okay good sharing prof murali uh, the DBA program is definitely very interesting. Someone with an existing PhD might pursue DBA. Would that be encouraged? <laughs> Lifelong learning, so why not? Why not? So, Janita, if you have time, uh, yeah, go ahead. Might be even for... See, if, if in my own PhD class, let me tell a quick story. All of you know by now I'm a storyteller. <laughs> in my own PhD class, Chong, trust me, the, the age of the oldest student in my class was mm. 88 years old. Okay? 88 years old. 88 years old. He already had his PhD, but he mm -hmm. did another PhD. Why? He said, I want to keep my mind active. So he started, he started uh, at the age of 77 like, when he was in my class when, when we joined that cohort. So it took him 11 years to finish that second PhD, but he started at the age of 77. Just to ensure, so when I got to know him, I said, why, why are you doing this? Why are you, I said, why are you torturing yourself? I'm struggling with one and you're doing your second PhD. He said, no, no, this helps me to keep the breast with my research, keep abreast with uh, changes in trends and technology, and also, you know, make sure that I'm, I'm alert. Yeah, he's still leading a healthy life, yeah? you know, it's now, uh, why wow, close to 102, 103, he's still fine. <laughs> I asked him, are you going to do another PhD? He said, no, lah, 100 plus 102, a bit hard to go and sign up for a PhD, but yeah. Uh, so, Janita, to answer your question, why not? Mm. Okay, thank you, Prof. Um, Prof, we've had the last question from mm -hmm. Adrian. Okay, uh, I have a bachelor degree, but I do not have a master qualification. Can I join DBA with 15 years of working experience? Okay, Adrian, let's look at the folio that you have. So let's let's strike a conversation outside today's uh, live session because I need to understand your uh, your bachelor's degree. So in fact, if your bachelor's degree, you have a first class honors degree, then we can expedite you onto a DBA. It's allowable by the program standards. Yeah. So I need to know what is your CGPA for your bachelor. What was the degree about? What are the folios that you've accumulated? Then we can have a conversation about that. Yeah. But take it offline with me and you can mm -hmm. get in touch with the organizers about uh, if you need my, again, my email is murali, M U R A L I, at A P U E D U M Y. Hmm. Okay. So, Adrian, maybe you can uh, forward your bachelor degree transcript to uh, Prof. Dr. Murali so he will evaluate and let you know for the further discussion. Okay. Also, other 
other experiences lah. Uh, any other certification or programs that is attended, yeah. So we can look at all of that. We are not saying yes, we're not saying no, but let's study that. So whatever, and we also understand MQA now is a lot more flexible with uh, people who come in with prior experience. So let's see how we can work within that space. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, that's all from today, Prof Murali. Okay. okay. Sure. So yeah. So today's session is ending here. Stay tuned and do remember to follow our Facebook page for more updates. APU is having postgrad e open day today from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Please feel free to visit our website and make appointment to meet our academic teams and counselor virtually. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Murali, and thank you everyone for joining us at this live seminar. See you all again. Bye. Thank Bye, you, Trump. Prof. Take care. Take care, man. Take it easy. You too.